Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week on Central Texas Gardener, find out how to save your trees in drought with consulting arborist Don Gardner. On tour, visit Annie Gillespie, who wrangled a flooding and unfriendly space into a new outdoor experience. Daphne Richards explains how to care for your blue bonnets and makes her pick of the week. And John Drongle shows how to tackle overwintering pests. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. Gardening on a slope can be a real challenge. Let's see how Annie Gillespie wrangled a flooding and unfriendly space into a new outdoor experience for the whole family. These days, when Annie and Trey Gillespie entertain, the front yard is one of their favorite spots. But until Annie wrangled the harsh terrain, the only safe foot traffic was for deer. She learned construction and drainage techniques as a kid when she joined her dad on his projects as a civil engineer. But her career as a garden designer started at home while she raised their family and worked in her garden. It was there that she discovered how her various paths converged. I enjoy building. That's what I love. I love designing it, designing it on paper, and then taking that paper and putting it on the ground. I, I, I just really love that process. It's very creative for me. I'm a botanist by degree. Uh, when I first moved to Austin in 1981, um, I eventually got a job like in 1983 at the which was what called National Wildflower Research Center, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. And I worked there about eight years. And that's sort of how I got a little more involved in using native plants and plant landscapes and launched my business after that. Recreating her own front yard was one of her challenges. This was a steep slope that dropped all the way down and it was just St. Augustine with a few oak trees popped in. In 2006, she leveled a space to build a patio near the house where prevailing southeast winds in the trees make it pleasant even in summer. I couldn't level the entire yard because that would have been probably a 25 foot retaining wall, but that now it's about a, a six foot wall at, at, at its peak. What we brought in primarily to fill that up is road base. And we tamped it down, we wetted it and tamped it down so structurally it's, it's not going where it's, it's really tamped down. but the edge between the pea gravel and the wall, I, want, I knew I wanted to have a little plant bed there, so I allowed a, enough room to put about 12 inches of good soil in. Plants soften the stone and the reflected pea gravel. She added a disappearing fountain to complete the restful mood. Even though Annie has dramatic terrain, gardeners in the flatlands can add levels of interest. This was definitely a slope, so that's really what dr drove the different levels in this particular garden. But sometimes if you think in terms of different levels, perhaps even in, a, in soil, you know, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll berm, you know, flat, take a flat piece of property, and somebody wants to create a plant bed on the corner, say. It's much more interesting to bring in a bunch of soil and berm it and perhaps pepper in some boulders and create some outcropping because you give the land a little topography and then you're also creating some pockets to plant things. So that's sort of fun to do with. You don't have to do that, but sometimes that's kind of fun to just change up the topography of the land a little bit. Another issue was drainage since rain is often brief but intense. Annie solved flood events on her slope with a dry creek bed. And the most important thing when you're dealing with water is slowing it down. If you don't slow it down, then it becomes very erosive, and that's where you get a lot of problems. So using large river rocks or boulders to slow the water down goes a long way to preventing washouts. 
Like many gardeners, Annie has both sun and shade in her front yard. In the shady spots, she includes variegated texture. And I think variegation pops a little more in shade. Um, in shade, you don't necessarily have as many things that will flower, but you can do a lot of fun things with texture and contrast. She added a deer fence to enclose her new garden. Plus, it keeps their latest rescues in. Outside the fence, she planted the front yard and driveway with deer in mind. back, the terrain once again prompted her design. That was just a raw stone cliff and then a flat St. Augustine yard. It was the only flat area we had, you know, to play and to go out and enjoy being outside with the children. Over time, I decided to go ahead and build that stone planter, but the water feature evolved because that little section of the stone is where water sheets over. There's naturally a waterfall that occurs when we have flood events, and it sheets over that cliff, drops and hits the, the lawn. The lawn is graded so the water flows down or around to the side of the house and flows down the hill. So I knew I couldn't put a planter right there. So that's sort of where the idea of the waterfall came from, that I'll just play off of what actually naturally occurs. From her experience, Annie has advice for other gardeners. I think sometimes people, when they lay out beds, they're too busy. You know, there's too many curves. There's too many shapes. And, and so I would suggest thinking in terms of long, sweeping curves, lazy S's, uh, and not busy it up. Just make it really lazy. And the other thing I like, I am a big proponent of, is thinking in terms of maturity and not overplanting. I like uh, to let plants grow up and have room to grow so that five or six years later after they fully matured, you can really sit back and appreciate the plant. This is when you should be really enjoying a plant, opposed to thinking, oh my God, it's overtaking this section of my yard, I need to prune this back. And I think that's a, a, uh, something in landscaping that's done over and over and over, planting too close to the house, too close together, so they don't let the garden breathe and mature. And I like having space and being able to sit back and appreciate a particular habit of a plant. Thanks, Annie, for sharing your garden with us. And now we're going to be talking about keeping our trees alive in drought conditions. And um, when will this drought ever end? <laughs> Don Gardner's here to tell us. Uh, well, I, I don't know, Tom. I wish I did. <laughs> Don, I, I'm a little worried. <laughs> Don Gardner is a wonderful arborist who comes on the program routinely and regularly to talk about uh, tree care. Know of nobody else uh, who's better suited for this topic than uh, than you, Don. So well, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, I love being here. Uh, let's talk about keeping these trees alive. A lot of us have misconceptions about where to water, what to do, what's appropriate for keeping, especially younger trees alive at this time. What are your, some of your top recommendations? So what's the first thing a homeowner needs to know? The first thing a homeowner needs to know is that they need to water their trees when the trees need watering, Tom. And a lot mm. of people don't quite understand that. And a lot of people think, for example, with their native mature trees, they don't need to water them. Oh, they've always been here. They don't need me. Right. Well, that's just not the case. Very few have been there 50, 60 years. May not have even been there during the great drought of the 50s. Sure. Uh, it's important to water your trees. The smaller a tree <laughs> is, the more important it is to water it. And mm -hmm. I say smaller, I mean younger, younger really. Right. The younger mm -hmm. a tree is, the more important it is to water it. Uh, here in the summer, if you plant a new young tree, you better be watering it three times a week if you expect to make it on the other end of the summer. Sure. Uh, that's a huge commitment to people, especially mm -hmm. if you're holding the hose and you've got to do it by hand. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I, I make the joke that uh, hardly uh, anyone can make a commitment to even their children to water to <laughs> do something three times a week, much right. less a young tree. Uh, it's just become critical, though. If we don't water, the trees aren't going to make it. Sure. Well, uh, let's take that example of a young planted tree. Now, mm -hmm. whenever, whatever part of, uh, of the year that you put it in the ground, mm -hmm. you're, you are making a, a multiple year commitment to get it through the summer times, uh, for sure. Uh, absolutely. Well, I, I generally say, Tom, that you've got to water it at least throughout all the summers for two or three summers. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a big commitment. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's happened recently in the last few years, though, I'll say last 15 years since I say the weather has gotten hotter and drier, yeah. is that used to we could water a new young tree, get it, get it established in three years, let's say, and then wean it off of watering and not have to water it anymore. Now, with the summers we've started having, people are doing that. They're getting their trees established, they're watering properly, and then they're backing off. They want to be zero escape. They want to be, you know, sure. conserve water. Uh, but those trees are not making it in mm -hmm. these summers that we're having, even though they're well established. Mm -hmm. And so one of the really important things for folks is if you've got a tree that's been planted in the last 10 years, I will say, it, you have got to water it in these harsh summers we have. Mm -hmm. At least once a week in the harsh summers, that will do it. Okay. Now let's describe how to water. Well, how to water is really depends on the size of the tree, the age of the tree, the weather that we're having. Mm -hmm. But generally, I would say, let, let, let's take mature trees. Uh, in our good part of the year, let's say September through May, and I break the year into two parts and then I overlap them a little, September through May, once a month or once every other month, if the weather's kind of normal and not too hot and we're sort of having some rains along. Once you get from May to September, though, uh, some of that's <coughs> going to be really hard and hot. And then in that period of time, you've got to water the trees. At, and we're talking about mm -hmm. older trees, bigger trees, once a month in those hard, mm -hmm. harsh times. Once we get to 100-degree afternoons, you cannot let your tree go a whole month without watering. Right. It's got to come in like two to three weeks. Get that ground soaked under the trees. Right. Young trees, you just got to water them two or three times a week in the summer and at least once a week all year long. If we get an a inch or more of rain, you can put that off for a week if you're watering a young tree. But once that week's passed, right back to yeah. watering the tree. Or light showers do not count when they it comes to watering count. trees. A significant rainfall, I call it, inch or more. Mm -hmm. I try to get people to put those inch or more rainfalls on their calendar because three weeks later, you can, it seems like it was a yes, two sir. months earlier. Right, right. If you don't know when your last significant rain was, you mm -hmm. have a very hard time knowing when to water your trees. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you know, one thing that w I think people have gotten much more attuned to is uh, the, where to water, yeah. um, uh, where the, the roots of the trees are that are going to be taking the water in. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's still a lot of folks who think that you put the water right at the trunk. Yeah. Um, but more and more people seem to be waking up to the fact that you've got to go out there beyond that drip line. How, where do you recommend the real targeted area for watering should be? Well, uh, uh, let's let's talk about a medium age tree. Let's talk mm. about a 10 to 15 year old tree. It's not a really old tree. It's mm. not a little bitty tree that you've got to water. Small trees right. that you just plant, you've got to put the water right in the root ball mm. until the tree gets started. Tree roots will grow out of the root ball that you dug for it after they're established, not the first couple of years perhaps here, but after they're established, 18 to 24 inches a year. Mm -hmm. So you've got to keep moving with the roots. Once you get your little tree established, then you got to start watering further out where the roots are going. For a young tree, you water right in the root ball. For trees that are 10 years old or older, uh, you don't want to water at the root ball. In fact, all kinds of funguses are hanging out at the base of trees, all trees, all the time, all our soils. Water is like food to funguses, and mm -hmm. so we just say when you're watering yourself, don't water the trunk area. When it rains, it's going to water it. We can't do anything sure. about that. But a 10-year-old tree is very likely to have a 20-foot root spread, uh, the radius of the roots, 20 feet out on all sides. You don't need to water the first five feet from the trunk. The big roots come off, but the fine feeder roots, the root fans, are out there from five feet to 20 feet. Mm -hmm. And so that's the band, a big donut around a tree that you water. Now, if you're even more constricted or limited on your water, you get out about the outside of the branch line of the tree and try to water a little outside the branch line and a little inside the mm -hmm. branch line. And that's where 
soaker hoses are going to come in handy in the future for watering trees. And people are figuring out some innovative ways of moving soaker hoses. One of the problems with soaker hoses watering trees is that they don't water out very far, sure, and you got to. And band, most people yeah. have got to mow their grass, so the soaker hoses are going to be in the way. Nonetheless, with soaker hoses or with any way you want to water, the outside of the donut, end of the branches, a little bit outside, a little bit inside, is the, the prime area to water trees. Sure. If you just water that area, your tree will prosper and be healthy and vigorous. Sure. Uh, so, again, look to the drip line and that donut, as you describe it, outside of that. Outside I think it's really critically important. Now, uh, there are a couple different things that I think are really interesting that we, start, we were talking about before the interview, and that is the different kinds of roots. There are woody roots. And they're absorbing roots. There are. And we've been losing trees uh, throughout Central Texas because those absorbing roots have been uh, receding or dying on a lot of these uh, trees. Absolutely dying. The, the, the dynamic with the heat and the drought that we've been having is that the, small, the heat and the drought uh, starts killing the small feeder roots. Mm -hmm. And they may be way out from the tree when the drought first starts, mm -hmm. but they began to disappear. Uh, some people call it dropping the roots. Trees mm -hmm. don't actually drop them, but they disconnect from them. Mm -hmm. And the root systems get smaller and smaller and smaller until after a while the tree has only woody roots, and that's when we start seeing the crown die or total death in the tree. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the fine feeder roots are really what we need to keep alive, and it's what we water and what we uh, build up the soil or mm -hmm. amend the soil to take care of. Yeah, I think it, that, that thinking of it is the spongy area, of the, the root zone, and keeping that adequate moisture in the soil to sustain that. Because otherwise, I mean, the, the tree could actually lose moisture through those uh, exposed soft roots. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, they, so they, they'll start to shed them. Yeah, well, and, and it's a balance. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, and some people say, never let your soil get too dry. I will often say that. Some people say, keep an even soil moisture. But, but people I've talked to in the last couple of years, homeowners, they, they have trouble with what's called even soil moisture, which is an ideal situation. But around here, oh, three or four days of heat will take any even soil moisture you were even yeah, considering right, right yeah, out right. of the soil. <laughs> so really, I think the thing is to have a regular watering schedule. Mm. Realize the, the length of time trees can go without watering and just figure out what works for you, but we've got to get the water to the trees. And, and it's, I think that's very wise. And, and also, people need to be aware of how shallow these root systems are. They are very shallow. Uh, you know, a lot of people still don't realize that roots go out, they don't go down, and even in East Texas where I'm from, roots don't go down very far. The soil's a little better, so maybe they go a little deeper. But here, 80% of all tree roots are in the top four, five, six inches of soil. So we have this little thin layer of tree roots that are reaching out, going for resources. And with five inches of soil and tree roots and five months of 100 degrees, <laughs> it, it's not a big, you know, right. duh as to, you know, why this is happening to us. Right. Uh, uh, five inches of soil, the sun's just going to take that moisture right out. It's going to cook it, especially in the kinds of soils that we have here in central yep. Texas. Yeah. Well, Don, thank you, as always, for thank being you, part of our program. I know that a lot of folks will want to be in touch with you. Don uh, Gardner, certified arborist and a consulting arborist who can uh, help you with your home uh, trees and make sure that they will survive the drought. Thanks for being a part of our program. Coming up next is our friend Daphne. Hi, I'm Daphne Richards. This week's question comes from Jean Warner. Her bluebonnet plants are up and vigorously growing, and she'd like to know if freezing temperatures will be a concern. And also, what can she do to make sure she has good flowers this spring? This really is a great question, since it gives us an opportunity to talk about wild, our wonderful native wildflowers. As more people begin to plant wildflowers in their landscapes, they begin to notice them at different times of year, other than just at spring flowering time. Most of our wildflowers sprout in the fall and spend their winters as rosettes, which are plants with shortened stems that grow very close to the ground, but not towards the sky. This strategy allows them to survive and even thrive through the worst cold that Central Texas can throw at them. So they shouldn't be at all damaged by freezing temperatures or even snow, should we happen to get any. And the way to ensure great flowers this spring is to water your wildflowers in the fall and winter, when the rosettes are actively growing and building up the energy to flower. Depending on your soil type and the amount of natural rainfall we get, and also how sunny we are, 
you might need to water as much as once a month on clay soils or a couple of times a month on really well-drained soil and that are rocky. But if we have a cool, cloudy winter with even one or two rainfall events, you might not need to water at all. If you do water your wildflower areas, be sure to give them a deep, thorough soaking. This week, we'd like to highlight a group of plants, winter edibles that are also gorgeous in the landscape. Most Central Texas gardeners plant these from late summer through fall, but if you got a late start or wanted to plant a second crop, there's still time to plant in mid to late winter. Most local nurseries carry these cold hardy vegetables all winter long, so you don't have to worry about sprouting your own seeds. Winter vegetables such as lettuce, spinach, Swiss chard, cabbage, kale, and broccoli not only provide you with food, they also look beautiful planted right in the middle of your established landscape. These days, there's really no need to plant vegetables in rows unless you just want to. A grouping of strategically placed oak leaf lettuces look right at home beside the fall aster and salvia gregii in your front flower bed. The leaves of winter edibles, which are what we eat on many of them, are truly striking and provide brilliant color to what otherwise might be a drab winter landscape. Try planting them among your perennials, which will live below ground all winter anyway, so there won't be any competition for space. Winter vegetables are naturally very resistant to cold temperatures, but an added benefit of having them planted among your landscape is that they're more protected if we get any truly cold temperatures, especially if they're well mulched so there won't be much need to protect them on cold nights, even if we're down in the 30s. But if you want to be extra careful, protecting with light row cover should do the trick. If you like, you can leave a few of the leafy greens in your landscape instead of harvesting and eating them. As they prepare to flower and ultimately die, they shoot up into the sky, which is a process known as bolting, and provide a striking architectural element to the garden for a brief period. We have a great picture this week from Nancy and Richard Simpson. Just look at the size and the shape of these carrots. Their organic garden produces fresh food for them all winter long, but this one was certainly a bonus. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit klru.org ctg to send us your questions or pictures of your humongous vegetables. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with John Dromgul for Backyard Basics. Hello gardening friends, welcome to Backyard Basics. So you put in some fruit trees, whether it was this year or previous years, there's some maintenance of the fruit trees. One of the things that's really important is uh, every year to pick up the fallen leaves. They may have a disease or insect on them and especially the fallen fruit. This is really important. This will control insect eggs, spray with the horticultural oil, hibernating insects are also in there, so we need to spray them. And then there are these diseases, uh, like I said, the bacterial diseases and the fungal diseases. Uh, the fungal diseases are leaf curl and uh, brown rot on the fruit. This, is, this can ruin the crop, really. And so uh, the other one is the bacterial diseases. They cause things like bacterial canker. This is really damaging to the plant, and sometimes you just have to cut the branches off uh, without being able to treat them, but you can prevent it. And so, um, sometimes before, sometimes after the pruning, you can do these kinds of sprays. It, it's up to you, really. Some of the types of products that we would be using would be uh, a mineral oil. This is one of the traditional ones, and uh, here's this one right here, All Seasons, uh, very popular and the mineral oil, and it'll suffocate. Um, this is another one that is uh, traditional, and that's sulfur. The wettable sulfur is the one we're going to be using, and the wettable sulfur is um, easy to use and, once again, manages uh, the uh, diseases and some of the insects much of the time. And so uh, this is another one. These are two effective ones, too. If you're wondering out what wor wor figuring out what works, um, those are two of them. Some of the newer products, though, that help us control disease are these two right here. One of them is called Actinovate, and this is a very good one. It's um, used to spray the uh, branches and to get real good control of some of the diseases. Um, this is uh, that important step that you need to take to really get your crops. You can't just put these plants out there and ignore them. Another one is um, the Serenade right here. This is a good one for fungal problems and bacterial. 
It's all about prevention, really. And so um, we have another one right here that's uh, multi-purpose. It's called Organicide. These things are widely available, too. It's not like you had to go to a specialty store. I like independent nurseries, though. And so this one will control insects and uh, disease, and it's a miticide, too. You know, make it simple and uh, get something like that. So you'll be spraying during the dormant period when the leaves aren't there. You've already cleaned up the fruits around the trees and any of the leaves and then you'll start that spray program. You know, there's another insect that we have to deal with, and that is the plum curculio. This is a big problem. For gardeners in, that are growing plums, actually, and uh, some of the peaches around here, that's the little worm that's inside. This beetle comes along, and with its long snout, will open it up, lay its eggs in there, and it does it immediately after the flowers fall off. And so there's this little fruit there, and that's when you need to start spraying. One of the things that's uh, very effective is clay. The kale and clay is uh, very good. It's uh, a registered product and widely used, and I know from uh, university research that they're getting about 78% control. That's really nice. And these are the devices that uh, make it easy. If you only have one tree or so, then this hand sprayer is a very good one. If you've uh, got several to do, then, and you can put the nematodes out with it too, these little pump sprayers are excellent. And for big areas, then this dial -a spray is a very good one too. For Backyard Basics, I'm John Dromgul. I'll see you next time. Find out more at klru.org slash ctg and check us out on Facebook too. Next week, see how to grow fruits and berries. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net.